Hello everyone and welcome to yet another Corporate Corner. I'm Cliff. And I am Will. Today we're going to be debunking a video from Cracked. Cracked is one of those channels on YouTube which posts occasionally funny material, but in this case it's just downright insulting. The series is called Hilarious Helmet History. It's a show that tackles common historical misconceptions and then tries to re-educate its viewers on the truth of history. It's a lot like Adam Ruins Everything, which we've talked about twice now, except where Adam's information is usually rather accurate but sometimes insulting in delivery, this guy is not only insulting in delivery, but he's also incredibly biased. Most of his facts are clearly coming from personal opinion and misinformation being proposed as truth. But hey, don't take our word for it. Let's dive into the video. Do we really have to? Just play the damn video. You know, I don't think all of those were helmets. That's because hilarious hat history just doesn't have the same ring to it. Ah, very true. You win this round, Cracked. Don't get used to it. Okay. Welcome to Hilarious Helmet History, the show where today's cultural historical misconceptions are even sillier than my helmet. 300 presents us with Sparta as the defenders of Western civilization, outnumbered by a galaxy of despotic Persian aliens. Its Spartans are basically the men in black, but for freedom. Out to save democracy from Persia's wacky oriental army of combat rhinos, the cave troll from Lord of the Rings, and a harem of quadriplegic female sex slaves. Still, you're smart. You understand that that troglodyte isn't a realistic human from ancient Iran. Yes, we are smart. The truth is that we are all well aware of these problems. 300 is a very over-dramatized movie. It's got problems, a lot of them are historical inaccuracies, and frankly, way too much mutilated alien creatures. We are smart enough to know that there are a lot of things that really didn't happen. But, you see, we're also smart enough to know that these aren't your real problems. Your problems aren't with the movie. Your problems are with the historical portrayal. So, what's with what's your real problem, Cracked? You understand artistic choices, but Frank Miller and Zack Snyder's Tom of Holland Fest movie doesn't just exaggerate history. It gets it backwards. They kept telling you ancient Spartans fought for... For our lands. For our families. For our freedom. But the reality was... Two out of three. If anybody fighting at Thermopylae represented freedom, it was Persia. Um, what?! <laughs> And this bit of anti-Persian trash talk, coming from a Spartan... Run along and tell your Xerxes he faces free men here, not slaves. ...would have been awfully confusing to a Persian. The Achaemenid Persian Empire, the one that invaded Greece twice, was the largest empire the world had ever seen. And other than a few long-term POWs, they built that Persian Empire without slaves. They generally banned owning other people. Whereas, as a Spartan soldier, Muscles McGee would have personally owned a bunch of slaves. And there it is, your ultimate problem and the main point of your video. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna say more problems with Sparta, but this is ultimately his message. Sparta owns slaves, therefore Persia is the morally superior people. The logic is completely idiotic, that I don't even think this guy realizes how ludicrous it sounds historically, let alone how ludicrous it sounds today. Let's start with the historical side. Yes, Sparta did own slaves. In fact, it was because of a massive slave revolt that led to Sparta pushing for a stronger militaristic style of living and civilization. And it's true that Persia at the time did not build their empire off of slavery. Want to know how they did build their empire? By conquering, killing, and forcefully integrating and assimilating other countries, empires, and cultures into their own. So, while one practiced slavery, and the other built its, built its empire on the bodies of dead civilizations and nations. Don't believe me? Ask how the Babylonians are doing. And even from a moralistic standpoint, this is nonsensical. The only way they could, the only way you could still call Persia the good guys in this fight is if they were going to Sparta specifically to go free the slaves. In that case, it's a battle between those wanting to keep their slaves and a country wanting to free them. But if this moron actually did some historical research like my brother did, he'd know that's not the reason for the Second Greco-Persian War. The Second Greco-Persian War was fought because King Darius of Persia lost the first one soundly at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. It was the first Greco-Persian War. The Ionian Greeks revolted against Darius, and the Athenians supported the revolt, angering Darius and leading him trying to invade and conquer Greece, which would give him a solid foothold for the eventual conquest of Europe. His son Xerxes wanted to avenge his father's failures and take Greece himself, so essentially it was his petty son wanting to finish off his father's work. Of doing what again? Oh yeah, that's right. Conquering Greece so that he could expand his empire into Europe. 
so he could do more kingdom and people squashing and more tyrannical ruling. Ah, yes, truly the morally superior people. Morons. Spartan society was a rigid caste system. The male Spartan citizens at the top of the Spanakopita were legally required to be full-time soldiers. Since stuff like farming needed to happen, that economically required Sparta's soldier men to hold slaves. Slaves they were legally required to beat. Persia's military had full-time soldiers too, but Persia wasn't psycho enough to force every adult male into their army. You are really pushing your own objectives and opinions onto this, aren't you? Why is it psycho to ensure all adult men fight in your army? What about South Korea, where every male must be enlisted in military service at a certain age for a certain period of time? Are they psycho too? Buddy, you're gonna have to understand, Sparta is a military-based country and society. I know it may be hard for people of today to understand, but back then there were plenty of countries that were required to have a harsh military style of law and military structures to keep its people safe. Persia, as we said before, was a massive empire that gained power by conquering other peoples and integrating them into its own. Why, Persia, why would Persia need to force men into the army when they have a large enough population to literally conscript people? And furthermore, while you may see the idea as psycho, the Spartans didn't. In fact, they took pride in it. They were happy to serve as soldiers and believed only true men would fight. To not be able to fight was a huge dishonor, which is why they were willing to go through the training and discipline from boyhood to adulthood. It's a different culture, damn it! Instead, they recruited a military from across their empire, paid for it with tax dollars, and ran it with a federal government. That sounds awfully modern for happening 2,500 years ago. And the more you look at ancient Persia, the more Western they seem. <laughs> now hold up there. Are you trying to imply that the Persians were built in a more Western and civilized way than the Spartans? Hmm. I'd like to show this clip real quick. The pursuit of perfection made Sparta a strange place, where money was outlawed, equality was enforced, and weak children were exterminated. Male homosexuality was compulsory, and women enjoyed a degree of social and sexual freedom that was quite simply unheard of in the ancient world. Its history is one of ruthless militarism, slavery on a massive scale, and a system that can sometimes seem like a premonition of modern day totalitarian regimes. But Sparta was the first Greek city to define the rights and duties of its citizens. And it can also claim, alongside Athens, to have saved the Western world from enslavement by the Persian Empire. Although Spartan hardline ideals don't have the charisma of Athenian culture, they've meant as much to Western civilization as the ideals represented by the Parthenon. So in a sense, the story of the Spartans is the story of ourselves and how some of the ideas that have molded Western civilization were first tried out in a warrior state on the Greek mainland over two and a half thousand years ago. But after all, what do we know? And what, what does that video know? I mean, they're just an actual historical documentary and you're just a very unfunny, cracked individual. Their empire's founder, Cyrus II, was a multiculturalist. He didn't force his religion on the many territories he conquered. His actions even helped free the Jewish tribes in captivity in Babylon so they could go build a new temple in Jerusalem. Nope. No religions are forced in Persia. Just the government, the laws, the punishments, the economics, the traditions, and the culture. But come on, what's that got to do with anything? All right. Most successful empires know that it's easier to maintain control of large areas of controlled peoples by giving them a little bit of freedom to live their own way while still paying homage, aka taxes, to the empire. Genghis Khan knew this. The Romans, for the most part, knew this. And the Persians knew this. But that doesn't change the fact that while Cyrus might have been a decent enough guy, it isn't Cyrus we're talking about. Uh, it was Darius and Xerxes who invaded Greece. 
The same Xerxes that was perfectly okay with killing all the Jews in his kingdom because of what one advisor said. Yeah, they probably don't like it very much. And let's not forget how other cultures felt about Persia, like the country of Egypt, which was so happy to be liberated from Persia by Alexander the Great that they named him Pharaoh. That tolerance was revolutionary for its time, because Persia's imperial predecessors, the Assyrians and the Chaldeans, tended to rule that region by skinning and impaling people. Meanwhile in Persia, they are practicing crucifixions. And according to some historical accounts, they practice scaphism, which is where you tie up victims inside of a boat, cover them with honey and nectar, and let them get eaten alive by vermin. Ah, oh, again, revolutionary tolerance and truly civilized people we're dealing with here. I think I speak for everyone when I say, EW! If you paid your taxes and didn't revolt, you were a Persian. But if you weren't quite muscular enough of a baby, Spartans enslaved you, or <coughs> you. And Persian kings like Darius I, who the 300 movies use as tyrannical props, sorry Darius, were leaders who improved their dominions, building roads, refining bureaucracies, standardizing currency, and pioneering lots of good government work. Heck, while the Greeks and Sparta were busy oiling each other's abs, the Greeks in Persian-occupied Asia Minor were building a wonder of the ancient world. Yes, you are correct. They built one wonder of the ancient world. Want to know how many the Greeks built? The statue of Zeus at Olympia, the temple of Artemis, the Colossus of Rhodes, and if you really want to count it, the lighthouse of Alexandria, which was a country that was previously owned by Alexander the Great, and then his uh, became a successor kingdom after Alexander's death. So, But even if you don't want to count it, that's still three to one. So congratulations, Persia. You built a wonder of the ancient world, Greece built at least three. Goes to show how uneducated you are if you think the Spartans bathe their abs in oil to look sexy in some stupid macho way. In truth, the Spartans did ba bathe their abs in chest and oil, but that was for burial purposes. It was what they did before battle in case they knew they would die. But the movie is clearly fabricating the sexiness for audience approval. Spartans had chest protection. And I do love how he brings up King Darius as a man who wants to improve his empire by building roads and standardized currency and doing good government works. What is good government works, by the way? Well, he doesn't know. See, that's the beauty of being vague and unclear. It can mean whatever he wants it to mean. But how about we get specific with him for a second? King Darius was a great ruler. By implementing the language of Aramaic, building better roads, and dividing up his empire into segments to better manage it, the guy was a good leader in many ways. But the reason he went to war with Greeks was because he wanted revenge for the Greeks supporting a revolt in his kingdom, and because he saw it as an opportunity to begin expanding his empire into Europe. And while Darius might not have necessarily been a tyrant, he wasn't exactly loved by all of his people. He had to contend with at least two revolts, and it was the revolt in Egypt that kept him from starting up the Second Greco-Persian War earlier. But all that aside, good leader or not, it doesn't change the fact that from the point of view of the Greeks, Darius was an invading force seeking to conquer them, making him their enemy, and thus, in the context of 300, the, the bad, bad guy. guy. And don't worry, I've seen the sequel to 300, because I use my time well. No shit. I know it argues creepy crazy Sparta still saved Western civilization, because they fought for... A free Greece. An Athenian experiment called democracy. Of course, Athens was a democracy where voting was limited to adult male landowners and where Socrates was sentenced to death <laughs> for thought crimes. But no, this guy's committing the number one sin of historians. Don't judge the past based on the standards of the present. Yes, Athenian voting systems were built on wealthy male landowners. Tell me, dumbass from Cracked, who did the voting in Persia? Was it the wealthy female landowners, or was it the- Oh, wait, that's right, no one voted. It was an empire built on hereditary rulers, so no democracy. But I guess to this guy, a fledgling democracy is worse than pff, no democracy at all. Yeah, Athens was democratic. Some Athenians could vote on everything from major laws to who served as their generals. But the Spartans didn't save Athenian democracy. They actively kicked the crap out of it, and not just because- What the heck are you showing up there? That's not a picture of the Peloponnesian Wars. That's not even freaking close. That's a picture of, Byz of a Byzantine ship using Greek fire. And Greek fire, the first account we have of that, is in the, f is in the 400 AD. Persian victory at Thermopylae let the Persians burn Athens down. Three years after Thermopylae, Sparta gave up on fighting the Persians. Athens had to carry on without their help. Since Athens was just one city, they formed an epic alliance with the rest of Greece. And it pushed the Persians back. But then Sparta, 
got jealous of Athens' new importance, so Sparta started decades of brutal wars against Athens. And when Sparta started losing to Athens in what's called the Corinthian War, they no! You know, I know, I got it. I got the concept. See, Spartans did drop out of the war, but Sparta wasn't 100% behind backing the war either, because the main target was Athens. King Leonidas could only scrap together 300 soldiers to fight with him. But the Corinthian War, or the Peloponnesian Wars, you're talking about was almost 40 years after the end of the Second Greco-Persian War. At this point, allegiances of the leaders have changed. That's called the March of Time. We fought Britain for independence. We're allies now. We fought Japan in World War II. We're allies now. We worked with the Soviet Union in World War II. We were rivals literally after the war ended. See, times change and people change. Figured out the perfect way to turn the tide against those darned Athenian Democrats, which was to team up on Athens with Persia, which means those guys' descendants were allies. And they crushed Athens, Athens never recovered, and Sparta let Persia manipulate Greek politics to serve Persian interests for years to come. Yeah, but as we just said, times change. Xerxes was not in power when this happened, and he wasn't interested in destroying all of Greece or what it stood for. See, the difference is that Sparta, in the Greco-Persian War, was holding out against an invading force that had no business in Greek lands. Now Sparta was inviting them to help them fight Athens. So it's not that he's a liar, it's just that he's incompetent. Yep. But Alex, you say, how did we get Western civilization if Athens got squished? Well, a uh, lot of factors. In the following years after the Second Greco-Persian War, Athens grew rapidly in power. The only other city-state to rival it was Sparta. Athens was the head of the Ionian League, and it controlled over half of Greece with the Ionian League. This caused two sides to butt heads. But before Sparta and its Greek city-state's allies, along with its Persian allies, beat the Athenians, the Athenian philosophy and ideals spread throughout the Greek world because of the Greek wars. While not all city-states adopted these ideals, they lasted in Greek culture despite Athens being defeated. True, Athens never recovered to the same status it had before, but they never faded away until the Macedonians arrived, which is what I think he's going to say. That better be what he's going to say next. It's not what he's going to say next, is it? But one of the biggest factors was good Persian governance that strengthened Macedonia, a backwater territory north of Greece. Macedonia thrived while Sparta and Athens headbutted. But that backfired for Persia, because a thriving Macedonia rose up and conquered the entire Persian Empire, plus Greece and a little of India, thanks to Alexander the Great. Since Persian systems were the most effective government Alexander knew of, he copy and pasted them across his even larger empire, and now you're actually lying to us. Alexander the Great had the biggest hard-on for Greece and Greek culture, and it simply couldn't be contained. He spread Greek policies, Greek ideals, Greek government, and Greek art all over the areas he conquered, turning them into new Greek-owned city-states. He was famous for spreading Hellenistic culture in the Persian Empire and wherever he conquered. Even today, you'll find Persian coins with Greek lettering on them. He wasn't building Persian cities and monuments wherever he went, he built Greek monuments. He might have picked up a few administrative details from the Persians, but saying that he just copy and pasted the Persian system is bullshit. After he died, his empire came apart, which cleared the Mediterranean for the Alexander imitating, culture absorbing Roman Empire. Screw you! The Romans took way more than just from the Macedonians or the Persians, they took from the Etruscans. The Etruscans. They took from. Um, the Carthaginians, the Iberians, the Celts. There's way more than just... Will, 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 Will. I get what you're saying, but it's, it's not worth it. He's an idiot. But I have to... Will. He's an idiot. Let it go. Mm. Rome fell, the Dark Ages happened, that led to Roman-influenced European empires that colonized North and South America, which means Persia influenced America's traditions a whole lot more than Sparta's angry slavery town ever did. And though the Persians had faults, they weren't freedom-devouring monster gods. Despite what you've been told by America's blue-screen bullshit assemblers, novelty gun hat makers, and absolute finest muscle-toucher-uppers. And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. You see Sparta as the bad guys because they had slaves and Persia didn't. Therefore, Persia is better. I'm sorry, but that's insane. Okay, the name of this video is Why the Persians Should Have Been the Good Guys. But in order for us to know 
and understand who the good guys are, we can't just look into the governments comparatively. This isn't an argument of who has a superior government or system in place. It's an argument of who is the aggressor and who is the defender. Persia instigated the conflicts against Greece, who is working to defend their home from a foreign power. This makes the Greeks the ones on the moral high ground, and the clear underdogs and the defensive party. I think we should end the video here. In conclusion, the reason he claims the Persians were right is simply because they had a strong system of government and they didn't keep slaves. Despite the fact that he's almost 100% wrong on all of his assertions and doesn't back his claims with any real sources, but even if we give him any leg to stand on, he stands unaware of the fact that his logic can easily be turned on him. Well, I'm Cliff. And I'm Will. This guy doesn't know anything about what we're talking about. And we'll see you next time. Possibly dealing with this guy again. Ugh.